Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. How did I get into engineering? Well, it was an alternative to what I really wanted to do, and that was become a pilot, commercial pilot. And when I was young, I'd look up in the sky, and it was World War II, and I'd see all these beautiful airplanes flying at high speeds over my house, going from one airport to another. And I just wondered why I couldn't do that too. So I ended up joining the Civil Air Patrol in New York. I was a cadet, I was 14 years old, one of the things the Civil Air Patrol did at those days, they were still patrolling the coastal waters for submarines, and they would be the first ones to radio back that they saw something suspicious in the waters. And sure enough, they had a program for the cadets, if they wanted to do it, that they would give us a ride every once in a while in a light aircraft. I showed up at the airport at Mitchell Field on Long Island one day for my ride. They told me to go out to that airplane over there and wait for the pilot, which I did. And I was walking around the airplane and no one was coming. And finally this young woman was approaching the airplanes and I was wondering whether she was going for a ride too. Well, she was, she was the pilot. Turned out that she was 19 years old and her name was Lieutenant Ann Bang. I will never forget her. She gave me my first ride. So I went home to talk to my father about it and I said, you know, Dad, I really would like to take flying lessons because I really think I would enjoy it. I flew with this one woman, you know, over the weekend, and it was great. He was an immigrant from Italy, and he said, I don't have spare money to have you spend it on learning how to fly. And he wasn't too enthusiastic about it. Well, my older sister, she was 19 at that point. She overheard that, and she said, Dad, this young guy is 14 years old now, but in four years, he's like, we'll have a family already with kids. Are you gonna tell him then he can't fly? So dad thought about it a while and he says, well, he says, I don't have any extra money. He said, but I run a construction gang in New York. And if you wanna push a wheelbarrow, like some of the laborers do, is I'll pay you what you, I pay them, $13.95 a day. And the building, I guess, was like 15 stories high. So it was a lot of work to push that wheelbarrow up these ramps inside the building. Well, I do that on one of the Saturdays when there weren't too many inspectors around realizing that I was a young 14-year-old kid pushing a wheelbarrow on a big construction gang, okay? And the second Saturday then of the month, I would get out on the highways in New York, use my thumb because I wasn't allowed to drive. So I was able to hitch a ride each time to the airport and I'd take a flying lesson. It cost just about $13 so I had about 95 cents left over. And I sold when I was 16, and by 17 I got my license, which was the minimum age for the FAA. I was just so happy and thrilled about that, that I cornered my sister, who could drive at that time, and I said, Gloria, how about driving me out to the airport and I'll take you up for your first airplane ride? Well, she was gutsy and everything else. Sure. <laughs> and I flew from the center of Long Island into New York City. I flew around the Empire State Building and then circled the Statue of Liberty and then I took it back to the airport. That was my thank you for having broken the ice with my father. So that's how I got into aviation and that's where my real interest was. And I went to a school in Brooklyn which was a unique school called Brooklyn Technical High School. And they had a number of courses there. One was aeronautical engineering which is the one I took and graduated in. Well, we didn't have money to send me to an aeronautical engineering college. And so uh, I went to the nearest free college in New York called CCNY. That stood for City College of New York. But they didn't have aeronautical engineering. So I settled on mechanical engineering to get my degree, thinking all the time that someday, after I got my degree, I'd get into aviation, seriously. Well, things worked out that I uh, got my degree in February of that year, got married the same week to my girlfriend, and I'm still married to her, by the way, and I got my second lieutenant's ROTC commission. 
And that meant that in about a year, I had to serve at least two years in the military. So the first year, I didn't have to go in service right away. I took a job in California, got out there, and I worked for a company called American Aviation. They were working on a program called the Navajo, which was an intercontinental, not ballistic missile, but cruise missile. Well, I got to work on the wind tunnel model of that for about my first year. Then I got my orders to go into service. Well, I had notified the Army of my work that I had done, and if there was anything that the Army found that was close to that kind of experience, I would appreciate an assignment in that area. Well, the Army did something good. They realized that there was something happening down here in Huntsville, Alabama, that involved rocketry, and they figured they'd go ahead and assign me down here. So that's how I got my assignment come here. All my buddies went to Korea, I believe, at that time. And that was funny because when they were giving out the orders, the major was up on the stage at the school, and he'd say, Wilson, to Korea. You get up on the stage, you shake your hand, you got your orders, and you were on your way. And he went through about 15 names that way. Lambert, Korea. Well, it gets to my name, which is spelled M-O-R-E-A, pronounced Morea. But he looked at it and he said, Maria to Korea. And then he looks at the orders and says, well, no, no, wait a minute, no, wait. You're going to Huntsville, Alabama. He didn't know where it was and neither did I. <laughs> so that's how I arrived down here. And I reported into General Toftoy, who was the commander of the post here. And he says, oh, I see you're a mechanical engineer. I said, yes, sir. He says, um, there's a German group down here. He says, I really need engineers. And um, why don't you go over and talk to Dr. Werner von Braun, he says, and see if he can find a place for you. It's okay, that sounded like a plan. Well, I walk into von Braun's office on the next Monday morning. He already has my file. He's looked it over and he said, ah, I see you're a mechanical engineer. I said, yes, sir. He says, good, good. He says, I've got nine laboratories. I'd like you to take the next five weeks off and go visit each of my laboratory directors and find out whether there's anything for you as a mechanical engineer that you might be interested in doing and they might be interested in having you do. Come back and tell me and that'll be your military assignment. When President Kennedy suddenly made the announcement that we were gonna to go to the moon, well, unbeknownst to me is Von Brown was already assessing if that kind of a job came in this area, he needed some help. He needed some young Americans because all the Germans were getting very old. I didn't know that that was a story at that time. Found out later, you know, why I, I happened to be big. But he picked me for this new job that was coming along called the F-1 engine development. And it was a biggie. And it was the thing that would power this Apollo into space that we eventually would go to the moon with. Well, I didn't have any qualms about it. I thought about, what do I know about rocket engines? Only what I could pick up in that first year here and there. So I didn't know very much about it, but I was learning a little bit about management. And I was watching Von Braun, how he managed people and he was a people manager all the way. He had the, the desire and the willingness to trust a program like the F1 engine development to this young guy that had very little experience, but he knew me because of a couple of things I had done where I interacted with him, so he knew a little bit of my background. The budget at that time was $1 billion, $1960, $1 billion. That's like $7 billion today. I'm 28 years old, and I suddenly have this awesome responsibility. On the F-1 engine, we had a massive problem called combustion instability. And in fact, that still is around and people talk about it. Difficult to explain, most people don't know what combustion instability is. But I use an example that you can relate to, and that is, if you're sitting in a dark room, all the lights are out, doors are closed, and you light a candle, it flickers back and forth. It's a form of combustion instability. One side of the flame happened to see a little more oxygen than the other side, so it burns a little hotter. Pressure built up and kicked it over. Now this side's seeing fresh oxygen, it gets hotter than this side, kicks it back over, and it goes back and forth. Well, we had that in the F1 engine. 
It didn't manifest itself that way, but we have a shower head design where oxygen is being mixed with fuel and being burned and through all of these little holes in the injector. And what happens is that instead of it flicking back and forth like that candle does, you know, a few times in a second, it flicks around and back and forth 2,000 times a second. And in so doing, it's overheating because it's seeing so much extra oxygen. It's burning more efficiently and it's tearing hardware apart and pretty soon the engine blows up. We put together a team from all over the country of who we felt were some of the best engineers or people who knew something about combustion. And we put that team together and I gave them a $40 million budget. Go solve the problem. We went ahead and, and decided to cut some hardware based on can we come up with a compartmentalization on the injector by building some baffles in so that any of this circulation would be stopped by a baffle. And so we came up with several designs and tested them out. And indeed, we found a design that involved up to 13 compartments now. So we had all of these walls so that that recirculation going around and around and across would be stopped by a barrier. And it was solid copper. But solid copper would melt with the temperatures we have in a rocket engine. So now we had to have holes through that and, and cool it with fuel. So if you look at the baffles, we actually have little holes punched in it with a hollow core. So there's fuel in there coming through the holes so it cools the baffle. And at the same time, the baffle then maintains its, its rigidity and it tends to attenuate the oscillations of the real flame down here. Before every flight with man, we always had a man flight review. All the project managers had to get up in those reviews and identify the problems they've had, how they solve them, what kind of confidence we had in the solution. Well, it was my turn. One of the astronauts who was present asked the question, well, how conf confident are you that it will work the next time? And I didn't have any numbers to tell him other than how many tests we ran. But I said, well, I can tell you this, that of all these tests that we ran, we never had another case of spontaneous instability. But if you ask me, go run an engine this afternoon out here at Marshall and swear to you that I know it will not go unstable, I can't say that. But I'm pretty confident that it will not go unstable. He says, okay. Well, as we were walking out the door to go to lunch, the astronaut grabbed me, put his arm around my shoulder, and he said, Sonny, we know you guys have worked as hard as you know how on this thing. And I know that you're sweating it. He says, don't sweat it. Go home and have a good night's sleep. We're ready to fly. Don't worry about it. They had the confidence in our attitude toward how we approached it and all of the testing we did, you know, and how we were open to, to inter interactions from other areas that might know something about it. We didn't hide the fact there was a problem. We needed help. During one of the early test flights, the third stage, the S-4B, that stage had one of these J-2 engines that we had in the S-2 stage, where we're, there were five. Uh, we had this one engine up there. Its function was to circularize the orbit around the Earth of the package we were sending to the moon, okay? And after you circularize it, now you know the exact position with the computers we had, when to fire that engine a second time to translate it to the moon. It did not fire the second time. So I got the word that I needed to move over to pick up the fixes for the J-2 engine, find out what happened and fix it. And that took two and a half years to get to the bottom of that problem and solve it. And it was really a very simple fix. I have to give one of the engineers really good credit at Rocketdyne. They went back to look at the early firings of that engine just to observe what it looked like. And in the photography, they notice one of the lines that carries liquid hydrogen to this little smaller combustor on the end. He notices that something's dripping from this line. Now the line is a braided hose and this engineer looking at that says, how come that thing is, is dripping? In fact, I see ice on it. 
And they said, you know, in space, we don't have that condition. I wonder if the vibration characteristics in space of that line are just radically different than what we see on Earth. It's being restrained by ice and liquid on the outside on Earth. So they said, why don't we make it a solid line and anchor it better and try working that. And they were able to take care of it. And that's what the final fix was. They just went to a solid line and anchored it better. We never had the vibration problem in flight. It was 10 years and it was seven and a half on the F1, two and a half on the J2. And now I decided I've got to take a vacation with my family. And I get a phone call from Von Braun's office saying, you know, we just got a new project and it's known as the lunar roving vehicle. It's a car we're going to give the astronauts to drive. Then you've got the most experience at Marshall right now in, in project management work. Von Braun would like for you to consider taking the management of this new project. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. I said, I spent 10 years or more in propulsion. I know something about propulsion now. Didn't then, but knowing now. I don't know anything about a car, but I'm sure I'm not gonna know anything about a car that drives on the moon. <laughs> I was kind of being pleasant with him, but I was trying to tell him, find somebody else, please. The next morning he calls me again. Von Brown says, if you can manage a $1 billion program of the F1, and you can manage the fixes on the J2, you sure ought to be able to manage this simple job. It'll only be 17 and a half months that you have to deal with it. He says, and if you don't have it by then, we'll fly without it. <laughs> the biggest design problem we had was the wheels because I had an amount of weight that I could not exceed. And so I didn't have much of a capability to design a car that weighed as much as your car that you drive. In fact, the car could not weigh more than 480 pounds on Earth. Now on the moon, obviously one sixth that, but on Earth it couldn't weigh more than 480 pounds. Well, if you used rubber, if you even could use rubber, it ended up that each tire would weigh about 110 pounds. Just because you had to reinforce the rubber for the travel to the moon, because it was in a vacuum. A couple of the engineers working at the time on the project took a vacation. They were working in Santa Barbara for the Boeing company and for the General Motors company which had teamed up on the LRV. And they hadn't had a vacation in a while. Unlike my situation, <laughs> it was just a matter of months, okay? But they went down to Mexico with their families, went to Mexico City. And as they were walking around the bazaars and whatever, they noticed these young girls basket weaving. And they were doing it all by hand. And light bulb came on and says, hey, if we could do something like that with wire, we might be able to have a lightweight car. So they brought the idea back to the management. And they said, well, let's give it a try. So they set up a, a way of weaving the thing. And when we came up with it, and they weighed it, it weighed only 17 pounds. That made the whole vehicle possible. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gone to the moon with a car. So now I do take credit for providing the astronauts with the transportation system and the rocketry to get them to the moon. When they got there, I had a car for them, and they didn't have to go through a rental agency to get it. During the darkest hours that I was faced with, if I had given up hope, I would have turned my job over to someone else that hung in there and now and then got a compliment from the astronaut when I gave him a presentation one day. Just hang in there, do the best you can, and remember you have good people around you to help you do it and give them the help that they need to make that work. <laughs>